Transporting our gear has been quite the adventure for me, personally. One, it's getting it all to Austin, Texas, and then it's packing it. We had way more than we needed, but it was every filmmaker's dream to see a garage full of the best technical equipment that you could ever need to tell a documentary story. Rechargeable batteries, too? Yes. And when it was all said and done, we had over 16 cases that we were traveling to Rwanda with. on for the past five years, uh, the story of the first ever Rwandan cycling team in their attempt at the Olympics. And we're just getting ready for the last 18 days of production in Rwanda, Africa. So day one, we get in at about one o'clock last night and uh, I woke up at probably two and you just start thinking about the story. You can't get it off your mind and you're just wondering what you don't know. So this morning, uh, we go and meet the cast for the first time great group of guys. We were shooting B-roll of the team uh, riding, doing some training rides. It, it looks like the scene of a, a feature film. And we put two guys on motorcycles shooting two different types of cameras. So you're concerned. You've got two guys that are working for you that are now on the back of bikes. They're sitting backwards. I know that they're probably chafing their balls off in probably one of the most dangerous circumstances in the country. These guys don't have lines in the road. They don't, they honk. They're on, they're on each other's ass the entire time. And you're concerned. You don't know what's gonna happen. And this is Africa. That's kind of the deal here is you're walking into a risky situation to shoot these types of films. And you don't know if that thing's gonna, if it's gonna be shaky, you don't know if he's gonna get the shot. And the shots, when I looked at them, way better than anything I ever expected. So, huge wins today in that. Hooray. So the shots come out, everything's starting to go really well. About halfway through the day, it just starts to happen. This time of season is rainy season, so you're playing this gamble game the entire time. So for three hours a rainstorm comes and you're waiting and you're waiting and lunch goes from one then turns into three. And so you're feeling this huge sense of responsibility because you're burning cash, you're burning time and you can't fight the weather.
One of the things with an interview for me is, is the balance between capturing the story and letting the scene of the story where you're shooting it tell the story in itself. The metal roofs here, they make noise, and so your sound guy doesn't want to shoot here. It's raining, you don't know what's going to happen. We try four locations. I'm not entirely interested in this room, but... There is it's nothing appealing, but except for some of these little yeah, pieces in here, could act as it. We try one near an avocado tree, that doesn't work. The next location we go to, 15 riders show up. You just can't shoot there. By the time it goes down, we end up finding a garden to shoot at, and we're under a porch. And what we were trying to do, you, I'm a big natural light guy. I don't like um, setup light, and a lot of this film hasn't been shot that way. And so you're tweaking the light, tweaking the light. And so I'm fighting that tension. can hear everything. I'm not in everything. So it's a producer's job when the sounds go away. There's apparently a lot of uh, unnatural noise, that, you know, not to the environment. You know, it's kids laughing and radios playing all around the neighborhood. Hello. Do you, do you speak any English? Is, is it possible to be a little quiet? So, sh it, good? Thank you. Get up here. So we had four interviews to shoot today, and we got two, and they were a total bust. It, the light is gone in two hours, and we're going to have to light this, and it's going to just, I'd prefer not to do that. I didn't get anything I wanted because we were chasing the light. The dark skin here, once you get down to halfway through the day, you don't get it. And on top of that, you've got noise, you've got people screaming. And when you're talking about things like what we're talking about, about genocide and people losing their families, it's intense, and their English isn't that, that great, so you're constantly fighting this, am I getting it, am I getting it? And your interpreter is great because he understands what you're thinking, but you don't know what you're getting. I just didn't feel like I got it, and that's really tough. I'm looking at it today, and I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I can look at this two ways. I can think of some bust and stress out, or I can look at it and say I got 18 days to get four interviews done because without a story, it's just a lot of pretty shots. So really, I just need to plan the schedule like never. So often you make a schedule in documentary, it totally goes out the door. So I'm like, okay, this is a sweet schedule, like plenty of time to get from A to B. Everyone's gonna get to hang out, relax, have some lunch, have some breakfast. We even have Nutella, we can spread it on some toast. We get up, schedule set 15 minutes later, it's totally scratched. He's like, hey, it's changed, like this thing's happening, the story opportunity happened. I'm like, okay, so there's the schedule, we'll just start again. So you got 10 people that have their job for the day, that their job just changed in five minutes. Inside, like my hand is doing this, but outside I gotta do that. It's the difference between turning a cruise ship, which takes a mile, or being in a rowboat that can turn in one, in, in one paddle stroke. And where that applied today is we ended up going to a guy's house. We had 10 minutes to get it done. We need a go-go. Betty. How about a combo? Go-go. The great thing about having a you know, first-class team is that we run in, I'm asking for two cameras. It's just crazy. We got a whole scene in 10 minutes. That's what documentary takes. Everything like slows you down here. The weather, the language barriers. Just for, like, I can't do math in my head. And the exchange rate is like 590 to one dollar, which is uh, difficult. <laughs> Let me just say, exchanging money here is shady. <laughs> we took the van with Abdul, our driver. Uh, we pull up to this parking lot and there's a bank next door. I was like, okay, getting ready. So we're going there, right? And he's like, no, 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 we're going there. And it's just like this empty uh, room, like concrete floor, ceiling, walls. There's some rice in the corner and there's just this dude 
sitting on a stool with a wad of cash in his hand and a calculator. And so I, I pull out my envelope, I start counting out 20s and 100s, and they're like, no, 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 not that one, not that one. I was like, what? Well, why not? 5-8 and this one 5-9. Oh, okay. Do you remember? Yeah. Uh, what does that mean? Oh, it's a different minutes, change, right? yeah, He's like, no. A 20 is only 580 to the dollar, but a hundred's 590 because it's less money that they have to, you know, launder or whatever to get the money, get it back into Rwandan dollars. Finally, we walk out with, you know, 116,000 Rwandan, which is like, you know, $250, but it feels like monopoly money because you have just like this stack of cash. And you walk out and all the kids are like, give me money, give me money, give me money. You're like, sorry, sorry, I don't, I don't have any money. I actually have a shit ton of money, but I can't give it to you. So if you look behind us, it's probably blown out right now, but there's, there's uh, smoke coming up, or it's, it's fog that's coming up off the hills. And the film is called Rising from Ashes. So this morning we're shooting the movie poster. John took a motorbike and came up here and scouted the light. So he knew what he wanted. We sat down last night, he showed me the, the photo stills to say, this is what I want, and let's orchestrate it. But then again, we had a whole plan. We get up at seven and the riders won't get in the van. They decide they won't ride in cars. They ride their bikes everywhere. That's kind of law for them. Here we are, we're an hour outside, and it takes them 30 minutes to get here. We're totally sweating it. We don't know if we're gonna get the light. We're with John Russell. It's a little bit of a basket case sometimes because he's just insatious about getting there. He hates all the crews, he hates all the people, but um, he's good with it. So good. That's it, killer. That's working, killer. Let's do one more. I'm done after one more. In your face. Okay, those ladies are in the pictures now. Are those ladies moving or not, do you know? Okay, thank you. Whenever I'm in a, in a situation, is I, I, I call it the person of peace. So I'm looking for the guy who's gonna be the, who's got authority in that community and is respected. So this is Bedeste. We just- Batista. Bedeste. Join the Batista. John. Yes. Yeah, so this is John. This is John, we just met him on the side of the road. He spoke a little bit of English and he helped move all these people out of the way for John to get our shot. So this is my man of the day. He's a friend, new friend. Yes. Yes. One of the issues we keep running into is shooting a scene and then the massive crowds that come. One of the difficulties in shooting in foreign countries is when you get these cameras out, the equipment, we're Mazungos, we're white, everybody is around us. So right now there's probably 30 people behind me that um, are all interested in what we're doing. All of a sudden you have about 20 kids that run towards your camera. You gotta have crowd control. I've always wondered why when a white person comes into a country like this, anywhere in the world, and they have a camera in their hand, why people freak out and why you should worry about theft. And my friend Jake told me one time, he said, the reason is, is because what you hold in your hand could pay for 10 years of their life. When people here live on 63 cents a day, people are so poor. Hopefully you have somebody else with you um, to kind of take their attention away from the camera so you can get the shot. An area like rural Rwanda, you know, they're not used to seeing cyborg boy walking around with, you know, looking like some mechanized, you know, audio soldier. Uh, with all this stuff and so bam you're useless once the uh, word gets out and they all start flocking around you I can't get anything at that point and all I'm gonna hear is gimme money and uh, uh, mazunga you know if we have two cameras we use one camera as a decoy while the other guy goes and, and gets the shots that he needs what I ended up having to do was scribble in a notepad and look busy until they, and I, I'm so boring that they lose interest after a while and, and they disperse. So yeah, you kind of have to figure it out. I mean, that's the thing with documentary filmmaking is you gotta be flexible. The iPad's been huge for just having dailies. I've got my whole film as it's being shot. Um, that's a pro and a con. I wake up this morning, I've looked at the footage, and it's not what I need. And we've got to talk about the schedule because what Greg has planned isn't what we're going to do. 
we had to hash this thing out, you know, the, some of the stresses that were coming up with the production. That first day, you're out in the sun, we hadn't slept, it was fun, it's adrenaline, but once that adrenaline's gone, everybody just drops. He's not afraid to bring conflict to the table and say, hey, I don't like this. I, I don't have a lot of time, you know, every day I'm burning cash, I'm burning, you know, daylight, so we pull everybody together. We don't have a cell phone and I'm already feeling like a total mm -hmm. jackass every time I go up to Jack and ask him to do something for me mm -hmm. right now. I'm creating headaches for you. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. didn't even argue it. Everybody's a little heated. Everybody's got that little kind of fire burning inside you. Like if someone says like the wrong thing, you'll you'll just take it, you'll snap, and you'll just go. No, this is how it is. He wants to shoot. Role is. Yeah, he wants you're to trying to balance that out. And I'm trying well, to balance. Role, role I'm frustrated because I want control. I'm not getting it. I'm not going to get it and I've got to let go of that, and it's hard. Part of the tension is the fact that we've got to work through a schedule that wasn't going to happen, and then we've got to talk about the cinematography. I know these guys are great, but I don't know necessarily that I'm getting what I want, really need. I don't care. I don't give a shit whether the other motorcycle's in there. I don't care if you see photos. Essentially, you hire a guy like Jake, who's an incredible DP. I've seen his work, all these different things, and then you get this stuff that day that's not there. I only have two days to do this. I need it now. I want it right now, not yesterday. I don't want to have to teach you. This is not the time to teach you anything. And I'm going, where's the style? Like, I'm panicking because I'm like, if we don't get this, I don't have a movie. First off, you're pissed. That's, that's the, the hardest part of directing for me is not blowing up. I told him I need more out of him. There was a moment that kind of told the story for me in the dailies is that here's this peloton, this group of 19 riders, and it's just, I mean, they're screaming down the road, and they pass this guy, and he's on a, an old bike, and you don't think he has shoes on. And the team comes by, and this guy just starts barreling down, and he comes in, and they open up the peloton, and in the edge of the frame, after I watched two or three times, they let him in. And he gets there for just like, maybe 20 seconds he can hang with these guys. And then he pulls out, and the peloton continues. But we didn't shoot that. That's the story.